Hello and welcome to this month's drawing tutorial. This is the young lady that we'll be drawing this month because she's going to give us an opportunity to learn how to draw a face that is turned at a slight angle. So let's get started. I always lay out an exterior grid when I'm trying to do really precise drawings. That's because in the long run it's going to save you time and give you something to fall back on for accuracy. So especially if you're a beginner, don't skip this step. The first thing you're going to do is get a ruler or a triangle and just measure the length and width of your picture, your reference picture that's been printed out on paper or taped to something that you can write on. I like to make it easy on myself and see if I can just crop it in to make a nice even eight and a half inches in this case. So it's eight and a half inches wide and it is 5.75 inches high. So then you're going to set up a mathematical equation. So I have my 8.5 over my 5.75, set it equal to measure on your drawing paper, go with the longest measurement first. So since I know that my drawing is longer than it is wide, I'm going to measure the width first, or the length first rather, to make sure that I don't go off the paper. Um, so here I'm going to go with 10. So if I set my length equal to 10, what does my width have to be on the paper to make this drawing exactly proportional to my reference material? So then I'm going to cross multiply and get 57.5, set that equal to 8.5x, divide both sides by the 8.5 to get that x alone and then you come up with your x by multiplying 57.5 divided by 8.5 which I did on a calculator and it turned out to be right around 6.75 but I don't remember exactly what it was. So you get that exact measurement down on your paper and then you wind up with a drawing frame on your drawing paper that is exactly proportional to the one on your reference material. Then you see how I have all these numbers and letters on it. All I did is I found the exact center, I marked that down, and then I divided that into half, and then I divided that half into half as well. Make sure that you have the same number of increments from side to side and top to bottom and then simply do the same thing on your drawing paper. So I divided this length, my 10, there's my 5 at the center point, there's my 2.5 at the middle of that, and my 1.25 at the center of that division. So then to make it easy to go back and forth, make those increments labeled the same way. So the height here is labeled from 1 to 9, so I made sure that the height on my drawing paper is also 1 to 9. Similarly, the length on my reference material is A to I, and so I kept it A to I on my drawing paper as well. And now, whoo, all of that work is done, and it's time to start drawing. So, what I'd like to do first is to find the exterior shapes, and I find the boundaries of those shapes using my grid. So if I push up perfectly straight, and here's where I really do like to use a triangle, because then the triangle can stay steady against this side and that way I, I know I'm not moving my line up and down and coming up with inaccurate measurements. So I keep my triangle and I find that bottom point is right here and I can just extend it both sides. So you see it's right above the 7. And then the top of the head top of the head is at the 2 exactly. 2 and then on the horizontal axis it is D, almost D and a half, not quite. So now I'll come over to D and a half, almost not quite, and 2, doop, there's the top of the head. And then that other odd right above the 7 mark is going to give me the approximate place for her chin. And on the horizontal axis, it should be right around the D mark. So I'm just going to make a little hash line there. I'm going to do the same thing for the side of her face, and I like to go with the most extreme point. 
So on the most extreme point, her cheek comes out to a little over C and a half. And on the vertical axis, it is at five. So five, C and a half, and this is going to be my mark for the exterior of the cheek. And then one more. Let's do right here, this crux of the cheekbone. The crux of the cheekbone is right at E and a half, and right at about the six. So six, E and a half, right around there. And now we're going to sketch out the shape of the head within those guidelines. So remember, this was the top of the head here, and this is the most exterior point of the cheekbone. So then as I'm filling in this shape, I'm also going to look for things like this point here. It lines up right with the four. And I'm still going to have to clean up my shape, and I'm still going to have to make some changes to be sure. So this isn't going to eliminate all of that, but as I said, it's really going to save you a lot of time and be able to proceed with a lot more assurance the first time. Now these marks that cut into the grid itself are really easy to find. So I know that her sweater goes right up to the H and the top of the shoulder should be right by the six. And then right before the B is the second shoulder and it should go right up to about the six as well, not quite there. So I can sketch that in. Then the sweater cuts right up almost on the D and into her chin. Then the blouse scoops down from right about here to exactly at the E point. Like the F is pretty precise with that sweater as well. And then the shape of her hair, it's going to bisect the H, go out around, come down to the six. It's big and it's really fun and kind of sproingy. And then at the five on this side, see it comes down and goes out to about the C. So with that grid, I can quickly, quickly get my large shapes on the paper. And now I'm going to start to clean things up a little bit more. So I have a sketch line down. I'm just gonna come up, take a little bit more time and redraw things so that they look a little bit more accurate. Heads at a tilt are definitely trickier than straightforward ones. So if you feel like you're failing at this and it's really, really difficult, that is because it's supposed to be. I'm gonna do the same thing for the angle of the bottom of the eyes here, right under the five and right under the three. All right, so with those interior angles down, now I have to sort of resketch the outside of the face with those in mind. See, having those external angles, though, very, very helpful. I can even do the same thing for the mouth, but what I like to do more than that, so it's so easy to make an inaccurate measurement because I can put it on the line this way and extend those lines, or I could put it on the line right here or right here. So for small rounded shapes like lips and noses, it's actually not that good to use the exterior graph. It's more accurate to use a paper measurement system. I just mark down the length of an eye on a piece of paper, and here this end of the eye is a little bit obscured, so I'm just going to guess a bit. Then I see that the length between the eyes is one eye width apart. And then this eye is just a little bit smaller looking because it's angled away. But then measuring down from the bottom of the eye, this is it's the middle-ish of the nostril. And an eye length down from there is going to give me the bottom of the upper lip. An eye length down from there gives me the bottom lip exactly and almost an eye length down from there gives me the very extreme bottom of the chin. So then I can take those same measurements, guess at your first eye length, 
Let's see. Let's use our grid, shall we? Right between the D and the E should be the corner of the first I. So that'd be here, there. That would work. There. Then I measure down. One, two, three. So that's about right. So anyway, once you get the rough placement of the features with the eye measuring system, then you start to rough them in. So I start with these boxes that give me rough guidelines for where to place my features. And then I'm going to start just cleaning them up and placing them down. So this layout phase does take the longest of anything in the drawing. You can't move forward until everything looks exactly right. If your eyes are the wrong size or in the wrong place on the face, nothing you do from that point on is going to fix it. So before you press forward, you have to be sure that all of your features are in the right place, they're in the right size, and they look correct in proportion to each other. So I'm going to work on making that happen here. And that might mean erasing everything and starting over, but the system is never going to change. So let me push forward off camera and then we will push forward from that stage together. When the features are placed a little bit more accurately like this, you can go in and start to redefine. I'm going to do my redefining with a charcoal pencil because they are easier to see on the film. But you can use graphite and still at this point you need to be using really light lines. The important thing to remember at this phase is that you're just getting the shapes of the, sh of the features a little bit more defined, a little more accurate and visible. So that hopefully you work up the portrait slowly all together like this and that way you can see the mistakes as they emerge but before they've gone too far to change. So you don't fully render just an eye and then move on to the other eye and then the nose and so on. You need to work up the whole portrait as one big piece. So as I do this work to one part of it, I'm doing that same work to the rest of it. I'm making the pencil skip so that there are light areas and then there are also darker areas in the shadows, but I'm not just outlining everything. And that's the important thing to remember. The other feature that's going to help to see how the drawing will look um, as we get tone on is the hair. So I'm going to do a little bit more work on defining exactly where that hair falls on her face. And especially when I'm using this darker pencil, getting the hair on the face will help to size things accurately because it's going to look more like the reference material. So then I can help judge the space, the uh, negative shapes of the cheeks, for instance, in terms of what I see on the picture. Don't outline, though. You don't want the hair to look like a wig. Okay, and then just really carefully, since the line of her cheek is so clean and clear, you need to be very careful and put that down with just one line. And then I'm touching up the clothes here as well. Okay. So that's feeling a lot more accurate. The next thing that we're going to do is to start filling in tone. The tone of this first pass is just what I call a base tone. It's not the shadows, it's just the fact that the skin is never the color of paper. In this first pass, we're just going to use the pencil on the side, tilt the paper if you need to, and even go into the hair if you need to. Oh, one more thing before I start doing that. I like to tape off my margins. I do that because I like to have a nice clean margin around my drawing and it helps the lines to look more straight and interesting. I just carefully touch at the line and press down hard. There's a little bit on the right side and then I'm just going to keep the left side nice and clean going in, base tone, and I'm going to fill in some tone in the hair at the same time. 
So I'm just going to use the pencil on the side, really, really light touch here, especially in the skin, a very light touch. And do that to fill in all of the tone, everything except the whites of the eyes. I'm always following the same direction though. I'm not going up and down in places, I'm always going side to side. And you can even use these strokes to help emphasize the curvature that you see in the head. And I like to work on the head and hair together and then I do the clothing afterwards. But if there is skin in the neck exposed, make sure that you get that down so that's part of the skin tone. Okay, now that's all filled in and I'm going to grab my chamois cloth and blend this first pass. So what you're going to do, just use some gentle pressure, circle strokes, and see how all those pencil lines disappear. I'm going all the way up to my tape so that when I take the tape away I have that nice clean line. And I'm going to work the hair and the skin tone together. The danger in doing that is that you can forget where your lines were. So try to take a little care and don't blend your lines away. If you do get any smears, clean them up right away. That way you don't get your hand into a smeary part and make it worse and worse and worse. Just use your kneaded eraser pressed into a blade like this and clean them up. Then you're going to get a clean piece of paper that you can rest your hand on as you work. Right there, since I'm right-handed. And go back and redefine your lines. So this is just a repeat of the step that you just finished because you have to bring those lines back out. So you're just focusing on the areas of the features that have the most definition. So the highest contrast areas. I'm not going to touch this line right here, but I am going to touch this line here and these lines and the lines of the eyes. There's not enough contrast though right here, so I don't even need to touch into it again. Okay, so let me do this a little bit off screen, finish it up. We'll come back and I'll show you the next step. When you've outlined your features, or not outlined of course, but you know what I mean, they're more visible again, then you can start your second pass of shading. And this time you are going to focus on the shadows. However, it's the same process. So you're going to look at your page and find the dark spots first and then you're going to use small circle strokes and you're looking for the shadow shapes that connect over the entire face. Think of it as a complicated jigsaw puzzle and the shape of the shadow is one big piece that encompasses all of those smaller pieces. See how this shadow shape goes around the mouth, across the nose, into the eye, and so on. And try to simplify the shape as much as you can, too. Focus on this big main shape first. Okay, then once that's down, I'm going to use a large stomp. A stomp is basically just rolled paper. It's pointy at both ends. And you use it to blend small areas. So you're blending, just like you did with the chamois cloth, but now you're going to have a lot more control. Circle stroke, circle stroke, and I'm going to blend right into the hair. Let's see how the face, the shadows on the face are sort of developing like a mask. That's exactly what you're looking for. Just follow through the whole step, okay? All right, then you're going to add a bit more detail. I just want to get some of those really intense darks in place, like what I see in the eye. Oh, there's a really intense dark in the nostril and very, very dark in the corners of the mouth. When the mouth is open like this, you can see a shadow under the teeth and that's very dark as well. Just take your time and put it in really carefully. And then there's a strong highlight on the main part of the bottom lip that helps it to look like it's protruding. Don't overwork the features. But then after you put down some tone, you can use your stomp and just blend it carefully again. If you get some areas that are too dark, that's where your kneaded eraser comes in. The great thing about the kneaded eraser is that it's sort of like putty and you can mold it into different shapes. 
so I can make it really precise and pull out a small area where I need to lighten it. Or I can flatten it with my thumb like this and pick out a larger area like on her forehead. The tip of the nose, I should see another shadow, or rather another highlight there. And then on the underside of the nostril, right above the dark part of the nostril, you get some highlights there. When the shadow isn't very dark, you don't even need to put it in with pencil first. You can just wipe it in with the stomp because the stomp has been used so it has some charcoal still left on it. So you just wipe it right in. Let's say that I decide that this whole shadow is too dark. I can lighten it up and keep it smooth by blending it again with my chamois cloth. I remember though, that's really going to work best in large shadow shapes. But that just picks up a lot of the tone. So let's start some work in the hair. I'll show you how to put that in. And what you're looking for as you put hair in is the direction of the large pieces. So you're trying to put the hair in following the natural hair growth. So start at the base of the head and then follow that shape of the curl all the way around. And if you can't see the precise uh, pattern of hair growth, do the best you can because you know that it's always going to start at the base of the head. So you can always start there and then just follow it out. Where it's really dark, like here by the face, I'm going to choke up on my pencil and fill in that tone really solidly, keeping that line as precise as I can possibly keep it. But make sure before you've added the tone really dark that you're very, very confident of the shape of the face because you're making it so dark at this point that you can't really erase. So what I'm going to do now is just take some time and fill in this tone. You can draw that hair and then the flyaway hairs, just use a very sharp pencil, start at the base of the head, and then draw those little frizzy lines that add so much realism. It's not going to do you any good though to draw those until the skin underneath is the lightness and finished. And so it needs to be as light as you want it to be, smoothly blended and just as finished as you can make it because if you have to blend over the top of those little flyaway hairs, you're going to lose them. I'm going to add an eyebrow here. I'm using short, dark strokes with a lot of pressure, but just one stroke per eyelash. So anyway, let me uh, add some tone to the hair. I'll come back to you before I blend it so that you can see how to blend hair to make it look like a different texture than the skin. And then we'll be pushing on to the finishing details in the face and the clothing. Okay, I've got the base tone of the hair kind of sketched in here. So I'm going to show you how to deal with handling it from this point. And what you need to look for is these little highlights that are in the hair as it is. So you want to keep some of those. So what I'm going to do is just kind of look for any of those highlight shapes and get them etched in my mind where they are. And then for the large shapes, like this solid mass here that goes in here and here, I'm just going to go ahead and use the circle strokes or even curly type strokes so that it helps to emphasize what the hair is doing. And I'm going to go around and I'm not smoothing the tone so much as filling in the tooth of the paper to make it look like the hair is darker. So I just swoosh, swoosh, swoosh around and round. And in those areas where I have some highlights peeking through, I'm not going to cover that with a blended tone or any tone. And then here I have a little extra tone on my brush so I can just swoop it straight down and start work on the sweater. Just dragging across makes a really natural looking uh, ribbed knit texture look. And that works out really well. And I'm going to go back into the hair, do a little bit more blending and filling in. Being really, really careful next to the side of the face as usual. And here I can use some of that extra tone that's on my stomp to darken up the shadow by the neck and on the collarbone. All right, so then mash your kneaded eraser into a little blade and help to clean up some of those highlight shapes. So you're just taking a curl 
and you're picking one side and making that the bright highlight shape. So this is the part of the curl that's standing out. So it's going to catch the light and there's a highlight on it right there. And you can go back and re-emphasize with the pencil again and do that as many times as you want. Now if you want to put in this darker background here, there's a sort of pattern on the wall that's pretty vertical, so I'm going to keep that and just lay in just like the same way that we laid in the base tone. I'm using a charcoal pencil on the side and this time I'm just going to go up and down. Pay attention to your reference material. It's lighter here at the top corner. It's darkest down here. So I can lay the tone down a little heavier even from the beginning. Then I'm just going to blend that with my chamois cloth all the way up. And if I need it to go darker, I bet you know what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to add more tone and blend it a second time, this time using the Stomper Tortillon. So I'm going to redraw the line of her sweater and shoulder. And then I'm just going to darken this up a little bit so I get that second pass of tone down on the background just like this. And then I'm going to use a larger stomp or tortillon and blend it smooth a second time. Blending it in the same direction that I put it down initially. And now you can see that you do have some visible texture and pencil line. That doesn't bother me at all because I want it to stand out from the girl, from her hair and from her shirt. So I want it to be a different texture in the background. All right, then you can start to add some of the details in the shirt. So there's some really heavy ribbing patterns here. They're not difficult to draw because they're pretty wide spaced. I'm going to fill in the shadow shapes around that ribbing right away. And do the same thing on the other side. Just keep in mind where it should be dark and where it should be light. All right, we're getting there. Now let me show you how to do some more detail work in the face. I need that clean piece of paper back. So in the eyes, I'm going to now put in the things like little eyelashes. I'm going to pull out some highlights in the eyebrows and make a few lines that are more deliberate. This stage is really just a push and pull back and forth of lightening things, darkening things, adding lines, pulling lines out. It just goes and goes and goes until finally the portrait looks just like you want it to. And I'm not gonna lie, sometimes that doesn't happen, especially in your beginning work. And then you just get to a point where there's nothing more you can learn from the experience and you put it away, or in some cases, you throw it away and you start over again. But you have never wasted time. Just because every portrait doesn't turn out to be exactly what you were going for, if you've been paying attention to the process, everything is always a lesson. Okay, so let me put about 40 minutes into this, that sort of work moving around the page, and I'll come back and show you where I'm at at that point. All right, our portrait is coming along nicely. I need to do some more work in the sweater and the background and the hair, so I don't want to push it too far. But let me show you how you can do some work to make that sweater look more like a sweater. So the first thing I want to do is look for the shape or the, the shape of the shadows on the sweater itself. So I have these strong lines that I've already put in and then this curvature by the shoulder that's still really dark. Get that down and shaded first and then you can do your texture on top. So here I'm working on just shading this so that it's dark enough and then I can go in sharpen up the lines with my charcoal pencil and just start to add a little bit of the indication of that knit texture. And I'm just going to focus my efforts on areas in the reference material where it comes through really solidly. I don't need to do everything. I don't even need to do everything I see on the reference material. I just need enough so that it looks like it's going to read as a sweater. But I see that up here this shadow on the shoulder is darker than the background. Right now it's not in my drawing. So I'm going to darken that up. 
and I'm going to blend over these lines a little bit so that they're still distinct but not so liney. Then for those highlighted edge edges, use your eraser and clean them up and make them really nice and distinct. Okay, so I'm going to do some of that work on the sweater off camera just to save some time. Come back and the other thing I'll be doing is doing a little bit more blending in the hair and now that that background is more closely is uh, closer to being finished, let me just smooth it again with my chamois. And then I'm going to do some of this work. I hold the pencil at the uh, tip and I'm going to make some of these little flyaway hairs paying really close attention to my reference material. You need to do this with a sharp pencil, obviously, so that your hairs are really fine like hair. Then make them in one movement. Even if it turns out to be the wrong shape, don't go back and try to fix it. So she has quite a few flyaways. I'm going to put them all in the same way. And if your lines start getting too heavy, stop and sharpen your pencil before you go any farther. And you can go back into it and add some more. I've been doing some work on adding some texture to the sweater. So there's just a little bit left to do. I'm going to pull out some of these individual ribbing lines with my kneaded eraser. I'm going to use a sharp charcoal pencil and add some of these vertical lines. In some areas where you have light struck highlights on the clothing and so forth, you can erase those lines completely and then you're going to have more variety of some lost edges and some hard edges. So on this side, you'll notice that I've erased a lot of the line that defines her shoulder because this is the highlight side of the drawing. I'm going to pull out a tiny little highlight above the curve of the jawbone here. Usually where there are sharp corners that curve under, you'll get a little tiny area of reflected light right before the darkest line. So after putting that down, I can soften it a little bit so it's not such an erased line. A lot of doing this level of drawing is looking for those small, small little details that you can just use to push it to the next level. Once you have it pushed forward as much as you want, you're going to take off your tape. Do this carefully, just in case it sticks. You don't want to be pulling the tape really fast and tear the paper. But when you are absolutely sure that you're done, give it a spray with some fixative so that your charcoal won't smear. And that is all you need to do. After that, you'll be ready to mat and frame. This concludes the month's drawing tutorial. I hope that you've learned some things about laying out a realistic portrait, adding some shadows, working on textures in hair and clothing, and that you can take those lessons back with you to improve your own drawings in your own studio. Best of luck to you and thank you so much for watching.